on this Wednesday night, the young and the fearless. A message to the young people, you, you think you, aren't, you can't catch COVID, you, you can catch COVID. The anxiety over more Canadians letting their guard down as the weather heats up. Who will be allowed in and who will be banned? The complexities and the politics of reopening Europe's external borders. Battling Beijing's meddling. This influence is coming from a fairly sophisticated network. The criticism Canada is not doing enough to stop it. And powering forward to the Hall of Fame, the beloved Canadian hockey heroes scoring new honours. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. More regions of this country are easing up on public health restrictions and allowing people more freedom to get together. The four Atlantic provinces have agreed to a so-called Atlantic bubble. Starting July 3rd, residents will be allowed to travel between Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and Labrador without having to self-isolate for two weeks when they cross a provincial boundary. Visitors from other Canadian provinces and territories still must self-isolate for 14 days upon arrival. In Ontario, businesses in Toronto and the Peel region have the green light to move to the next phase. That means businesses like restaurant patios, hair salons, pools and indoor malls can reopen. And BC has moved into a much anticipated phase three. More on that in just a moment. This is all happening as an alarming trend begins to emerge in some places. In Ontario, there's been a surge in COVID-19 cases in people under the age of 20. As Eric Sorensen reports, the young may be less susceptible to getting sick, but they can spread the virus to those who are at greater risk. In Toronto, restaurant patios are finally open, haircuts are available, and daycares are lifting restrictions. And across the country, COVID-19 numbers are decreasing. On top of that, it's hot outside. Not surprising then that people are gathering in greater numbers outdoors. But the virus is still with us. The elderly know that. I'm eight, almost 80 years old, so i got to be careful. Young people, however, may be letting their guard down as they socialize more. It's probably not ideal, but also, I mean, I know I personally don't have AC, and it's like 33 degrees today, so I'm not interested in being anywhere else, really. Toronto beaches were filled last weekend with young people. Ontario's premier is worried about them. I'm going to give you a message to the young people. You, you think you, aren't, you can't catch COVID. Um, you, you can uh, catch COVID. The number of COVID-19 cases is falling nationwide, down 27% last week. But the age distribution is changing. The median age has fallen from 52 in April to 40 in June. The share of cases among adults aged 30 to 59 has remained consistent over time. But while Canadians 60 and over comprised 36% of the cases early in the outbreak, that fell to 23% by last week. While the share among young people up to age 29 has expanded from 19 to 32% over several weeks. The great outdoors can alleviate the spread, but an active virus this summer could be a springboard to a second wave. We should enjoy the summer while we can, because when the fall comes, there's a real concern that things will start to heat up again. And if young people are indifferent to the spread, epidemiologists worry they'll be a source of increased transmission. Young people, though they're less likely to have a serious reaction to this disease, are highly likely to spread it to those who will have a bad reaction. It's one thing to be non or less vulnerable, but what that comes with responsibilities. That means protecting those who are more vulnerable. And there is a blunt warning to young people and others. If they widen the spread of the virus, Ontario's Premier says he'll move to shut down the beaches this summer. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Part of one region of Ontario is still stuck in stage one of the reopening plan. Windsor, Essex, across the river from Detroit, has more than 1,300 cases of COVID-19, including several outbreaks on farms. Premier Ford says most of the region will move to phase two tomorrow, with the exception of Leamington and Kingsville. To reduce transmission on farms there, there's a plan to expand on-site testing with a guarantee no workers will lose their jobs if they test positive. Access to employment benefits and support and new guidance to allow asymptomatic workers to keep working safely without passing the virus on. British Columbia is transitioning to phase three of its reopening plan. BC residents are now clear to travel throughout the province. There was never an official ban, but people were asked to avoid unnecessary travel. Provincial parks and campgrounds are reopening and more hotels are expected to as well. 
British Columbians are encouraged to take staycations this summer to support the tourism and hospitality industries. Though the public health officer says precautions need to continue to prevent the spread of COVID-19. South of BC in Washington state, there's been a spike in new cases and wearing masks in public is now mandatory. Failure to wear one is a crime. More than 4,000 people in that state are in the hospital now with COVID-19 and one hospital near Seattle has run out of beds. The situation is worse in some other states. As Jennifer Johnson reports, the rate of new infection is surging back to where it was in April. The U.S. is reporting almost 35,000 new cases of COVID-19 Wednesday, levels not seen since April. Texas is breaking records, Florida too, a staggering 5,500 new cases in one day. We have large parts of the country uh, that, are, that believe that somehow the pandemic is over. That is going to get us into a lot of trouble. The governors of New York, New Jersey and Connecticut, once the pandemic's epicenter, are now demanding any visitor from a high-risk state quarantine for 14 days. We have taken our people through hell and back. And the last thing we need to do right now is to subject uh, our folks to, to another round. As cases rise in California, there's a new high-tech tool for travelers at Los Angeles International Airport, the third busiest in the world. Thermal imaging cameras checking temperatures. I think it's necessary, 100%. Rates are spiking in Arizona, too, where U.S. President Donald Trump rallied young Republicans at a Phoenix megachurch, again using a racist name for the virus. Kung flu. Yeah. Next month, the federal government begins testing of what it says is its most promising vaccine. A thousand people in Chicago volunteering to get it. It could be the beginning of the end of this god-awful pandemic. The vaccine is one of several in the works worldwide, but the virus is showing no signs of slowing down. And experts fear protests earlier this month and the busy July 4th holiday will keep cases surging. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. The European Union is expected to decide this week how it will relax travel restrictions to Europe, allowing people from some non-European countries to visit this summer. Some countries may not make the safe list, though. Brazil, Russia and the United States could remain banned. Redmond Shannon is in London to explain why it's far from a straightforward decision for European leaders. Redmond? Donna, anyone looking to travel from Canada to the UK right now is obligated to self-isolate for 14 days. But there are almost no options for anyone looking to travel from Canada to the European Union, the bloc that the UK left back in January. However, come July 1st, at the height of the tourist season, most of the EU could reopen its external borders. The tricky decision for leaders there will be which countries should they leave off the approved visitors list. EU nations are haggling over what criteria to use. They are reportedly going to look at the total number of new cases per capita in the past two weeks. That's likely good news for people coming from Canada, but not for those from south of the border. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was asked for his reaction to the reports that travelers from the United States would still be banned. Uh, we certainly don't want to reopen a play that jeopardizes the United States from uh, people traveling here, and we certainly don't want to cause problems anyplace else. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in the coming weeks uh, we'll figure that out, as between not only the United States and the EU, uh, but the United States and other parts of the world, too. Of course, the number of cases in a country can often be low because of a low level of testing or because of unreliable data. And that will make this a political decision as much as a safety one. Ottawa could also be faced with deciding whether to return the favour to EU countries. Some of them have much higher infection rates than Canada. The EU may announce the so-called safe list of countries later this week, along with the measures that travellers will have to take when arriving. Donna? All right, Redmond Shannon in London, thank you. The International Monetary Fund says the decline in global growth is worse than forecast. It now predicts the global economy will shrink 4.9% this year. That's significantly worse than the 3% drop it predicted in April. It would be the worst annual contraction since immediately after the Second World War. The IMF estimates Canada's GDP will decline by 8.4% in 2020, and that's a 2.2% steeper drop than forecast two months ago. The IMF does expect a rebound next year, as long as there isn't a big second wave of COVID-19. Another risk to Canada's future, according to a national security review, is interference from China. 
An analysis by Global News of the report found Canada is doing little to combat increasingly aggressive attempts by foreign countries, notably China, who seek to interfere in Canada and influence political and business leaders. Even a perception of influence is now under scrutiny. Canada's foreign affairs minister has repaid two mortgages he had with the state-owned Bank of China after the opposition criticized him for it. François-Philippe Champagne says the mortgages never influenced his work. But as David Aiken explains, China is weaponizing investment and trade. Whenever Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou makes a court appearance to fight her extradition to the United States, she is cheered by supporters, some of whom are believed by Canadian security services to be helped by Chinese agents operating in Canada. A Global News investigation finds that China is having success undermining Canadian values, often using what China calls its United Front, a global influence and espionage network that is active in Canada. The Chinese Communist Party has been very aggressive in building up its network of United Front organizations over the last few decades. China's government targets elites in Canada, such as business and academic leaders, but also politicians at all levels and from all parties. Sometimes they'll be offered sweet business deals, free or assisted travel to China, and other benefits. This influence is coming from a fairly sophisticated network of activists, uh, diplomats, as well as uh, institutions and organizations here in Canada. China's goal? Intelligence experts say it's to get Canadian influencers to advocate for Chinese government policy in Canada. Canadian security officials have been warning about this pernicious and dangerous kind of influence for more than a decade. The recently released national security assessments indicate Canada is doing little to counter these incursions by the Chinese government. There is work to be done. The Canadian Security Intelligence Service told the all-party National Security and Intelligence Committee, CSIS has assessed that Canada is an attractive and permissive target. That all-party parliamentary committee has put about 10 recommendations in front of the Trudeau government that it believes can stop or slow Chinese government influence in Canada. Donna? David Aiken, thanks. The huge plume of dust over the Caribbean coming up where the dust storm comes from and where it's headed. Plus, the makers of a popular herbicide settle a multi-billion dollar lawsuit. A huge dust storm that started in the Sahara Desert has blown all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. It's clouded the skies over Puerto Rico, Cuba and the Caribbean islands and it's still moving. It's expected to cloud the U.S. Gulf Coast on Thursday and Friday. And if the view on the ground doesn't give you an idea of how thick the dust is, this is what it looked like from the International Space Station as it blew over the Atlantic Ocean. The German pharmaceutical company Bayer is paying more than $10 billion to settle lawsuits over claims the weed killer Roundup, made by its subsidiary Monsanto, causes cancer. The company has agreed to pay up to $10.9 billion U.S. to settle thousands of lawsuits. Monsanto maintains the herbicide is safe, but the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified it as a probable human carcinogen in 2015. Settlement ends about 75% of the litigation involving Roundup, but a number of other lawsuits are still ongoing. Charges against a First Nations chief in Alberta accused of assaulting an RCMP officer have been withdrawn. Dashcam video showed what happened in a parking lot in Fort McMurray in March. After accusing a Mountie of harassing him, a second officer runs at Chief Alan Adam, grabs him by the neck and shoulders, tackles him and punches him in the head. The RCMP at first said the actions of the officers were reasonable. Today, as Heather Urex West explains, that changed. Chief Alan Adam is relieved. I'm overwhelmed of the fact that the charges have been drawn because, you know, we knew, my wife and I knew that we didn't do nothing wrong. Images of his March arrest were captured by RCMP dash camp. The 12 minute long video shows RCMP officers approaching Adam's truck. Its license plate was expired. Adam, who was not driving, tells the officers twice to go away. When an officer goes to speak with Adam, the chief comes out of the truck, taking off his jacket. He's told to calm down and get back in the truck. When he does, the officer grabs Adam's wife by the arm. 
An officer can be seen grabbing Adam's arm and appears to be trying to put it behind his back. That's when a second officer runs in, tackling Adam, punching him, and putting him in a chokehold. Adam was later charged with resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. But after reviewing the evidence, both charges were withdrawn. The Attorney General's decision today validates Chief Adam's view that the RCMP charges were laid as a police shield to their aggressive and abusive conduct, not a true belief that criminal activity had occurred. The Alberta Serious Incident Response Team, an independent body that looks into allegations of police misconduct, is investigating whether RCMP members did anything wrong. That investigation was launched earlier this month after Chief Adam went public with his experience. But he, along with the Assembly of First Nation Regional Chief, say more needs to be done to change how Indigenous people are policed. If the RCMP are going to treat our, treater, our leaders like this, if they're going to treat a chief like this, what are they getting away with doing to our own citizens? Police need to be accountable to the people they serve. ACERT says its investigation will continue if that investigation finds RCMP members were not justified in the level of force used against Adam, criminal charges could be laid. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. In the U.S., three men have been indicted on murder charges in the death of Ahmad Arbery, a young unarmed black man who was shot and killed in Georgia. Three white men, Gregory McMichael, a former police officer, and his son, along with William Bryant, have been indicted on malice and felony murder charges in Arbery's death. The 25-year-old was shot and killed on February 23rd in Georgia. In May, video was released showing what happened. McMichael told police he believed Arbery was a burglar. Arbery's family says he was just out for a run. Still ahead, the footage fueling calls to change. Who responds to 911 calls? An RCMP officer in B.C. has been placed on desk duty and two investigations and a lawsuit are underway. It all relates to what happened during what was supposed to be a wellness check on a young woman in Kelowna. Wellness checks and how they are handled are under scrutiny in this country. Abigail Beeman takes a look at what they are and whether who responds needs to change. And a warning, some of what you're about to see may be disturbing. Drag down the hall in a sports bra. When Mona Wang lifts up her head, you see the RCMP officer drop down her foot, then later pulls her by the hair. I don't know why she kicked my head down in the first place. I think I was just asking her a question and I was on the floor already. So why does she feel the need to kick me when I'm already down? In court documents, the RCMP say the use of force was more than reasonable and necessary. Wang's boyfriend had called 911 saying she was in mental distress. And this is just the latest example of a call like that with a disturbing outcome. Ajaz Chowdhury was killed by police this past weekend. It was immoral and wrong. In New Brunswick, the deaths of Chantal Moore and Rodney Levi all tied to mental health concerns. The Centre for Addiction and Mental Health is now calling for mental health specialists to respond to mental health crises, not police officers. If you had chest pain at the end of today, God forbid, you'd want somebody with medical training to help you out, not a police officer. Criminologist Jennifer Lavoie is developing training for police around mental health, training she says is badly needed. A regular constable is going to have to know how to respond to a mental health call because they they will happen in ways that maybe are unexpected like check well-being a traffic stop a domestic situation a trespass call many police forces already work alongside mental health specialists in mobile crisis units the head of the canadian police association says there aren't enough of them and the findings of all of those examinations are we need more capacity uh, in the community to deal with mental health issues so we support that, but I don't think this is an either-or proposition. He says of the 13 million calls police get a year, fewer than 1% involve use of force. At 3 o'clock in the morning when somebody's wielding a knife and they're suffering from a mental health crisis, that is not the time to bring in mental health practitioners. It's time for the RCMP to go in, get that person calm, get them to a place of safety and get them the help they need. The head of the RCMP pushed back against the idea of defunding police, rather funding more services alongside it. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. 
scooter sign off a trademark two wheeler hits a wall. After a bumpy two decades, the Segway has come to the end of the road. Manufacturing of the personal transporter, popular with tourists and police officers, will stop July 15th. Sales never really took off. It was expensive and could be dangerous. In 2010, the company owner died after driving one off a cliff. Former Calgary Flame star Jerome McGinley and five others are riding high tonight. They've just been voted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Jerome. Aguila was one of the NHL's most dominant power forwards for more than a decade. Born near St. Albert, Alberta, Aguila made his NHL debut in 1995 when he was drafted by Dallas before being signed by the Flames a year later. Aguila quickly stole the hearts of many fans in Calgary, leading the team's scoring for 11 of the 15 seasons he was there. He ended his career with 625 NHL goals. The Edmonton, Alberta native recorded 1,300 points in 1,554 NHL regular season games. Jerome Aginla was just as big a star off the ice, giving much of his personal time to the community and to charities. Five other players were also inducted into the Hall of Fame today, including fellow Canadians Kevin Lowe, who played for the Edmonton Oilers alongside Wayne Gretzky back in the team's glory days, and three-time Olympic gold medalist, Kim St. Pierre. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Bird River, Manitoba, northeast of Winnipeg. Beautiful sunset. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.